Welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Const. What a week. I think we all aged about 50 years in the last week, and I aged about 20 years alone in the last 24 hours. Uh, we are a weekly show, as you guys know, and I try to do pickup interviews in between and post them on YouTube and on our Patreon. So if you're not subscribing already, I, I you know, this is gonna make a huge difference moving forward, I'll make the case as to why. Uh, but please subscribe to us on YouTube. We are about to hit 50,000 in less than six weeks, which means, oh my God, we could possibly hit 100,000 in the next, you know, other six weeks, I don't know, like within three months, I'm looking at Dorsey, our producer, like that's crazy. That is absolutely nuts. So please uh, share our videos if you can. Uh, as we grow, we're gonna be able to produce more content, cut up more content. And I would like to open up a home studio because we are shutting down the studio uh, for coronavirus. This is a real thing that's happening. This studio that Sam Cedar uh, offers us and he films his, sh his show, The Majority Report, out of, and Michael Brooks does his show from here as well, we are not gonna be coming in uh, once a week to film. So I have to build something from my apartment, my like tiny little one bedroom apartment. And so I'm going to make a real ask right now for those of you who love this show, who wanna see more clips up as the, as the news is changing so quickly, uh, please become a patron at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. We have new swag that just came in uh, for patrons who, who contribute over 23 bucks a month. That is like amazing. We've got mugs, we've got bags, we're gonna have shirts soon. Uh, we've got stickers, where's my sticker? Can sh oh, I can't sh my computer. Yeah, I've got a sticker on my computer. <laughs> I'll put it up on screen. Uh, but we're we're um, we're building this this operation very quickly uh, as we've been in a crazy election cycle. So uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who is a patron and thank you to those who subscribe. Please share far and wide because we need to be able to do this show uh, in the world of Corona. I was just called by a cable news network. Uh, telling me that they are not having people come in now because people go into hair and makeup and they ask you whether or not you've come in contact with somebody who has has this uh, this this coronavirus and they are now going to be doing all of their interviews over Skype. So we are going to be doing all of our interviews over Skype. I am going to be filming from home moving forward until things uh, hopefully clear up, hopefully soon. Uh, and we are gonna be turning around more clips, I think as a result, because it's not gonna be filmed as a traditional show. So uh, I just wanna say thank you to everybody. And thanks for those of you who, who came out to our Super Tuesday show in Los Angeles. When I say it's been a long week, uh, it's because I can't believe that was, <laughs> that feels like it was, you know, a year ago at this point, but we had an amazing Super Tuesday show uh, with Michael Brooks, Alona Minkowski, Anando Vila, Lucy Flores, David Dayan, and Francesca Fiorentini all on stage that night and for everybody who, who came out in California and Los Angeles. So thank you. Uh, on this show today, oh yeah, right, we have a show. <laughs> <laughs> On this show today, we have uh, Mark Longabout. Mark Longabout was a senior advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016. He is behind that brilliant America ad and just so many other ads and, and was, was just a key part of the, the strategy of the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. Uh, and we also have congressional candidate Nabila Islam, who is in Georgia running uh, to flip a Republican district that a Republican only lost by 400 votes. She's running as a progressive aggressive grassroots non-corporate candidate uh, to flip that district. And she discusses how her campaign has shifted in the face of this pandemic. So thank you guys for, for joining and, uh, and make sure to subscribe and become patrons. Senator Sanders, uh, Nomi Key Konst here. Hi. The last five years have been the most incredible, inspiring, moving five years of my life. I have been fighting for your platform alongside this movement with literally millions of people who have opened up their hearts, who have put their jobs on the line, in some cases their reputations on the line, who have fought, who have knocked on doors, who have made phone calls, texted friends and family, who've had hard conversations at Thanksgiving dinners and family dinners, 
who have opened up their pocketbooks when they literally cannot afford to. And they've done it, as you know too well, because they believe in the movement that you represent, that you have pretty much built and rebuilt, because they believe in your platform and they believe that they do not have a choice. If there was any moment that crystallized what is on the line, it's this moment. Right now, Thursday at 5.30 p.m., March 12th, we are in the beginning stages of a pandemic. We are uh, now seeing a, a path for your nomination uh, close in. And I say that as someone who uh, was part of the Unity Reform Commission, as you know, because you appointed me. Um, but I say that as somebody who, who fought with others to, to help build a better primary process for you. You know, we as a movement worked tirelessly for this campaign so that you would have a voice and you would be the voice that was the alternative to the neoliberal voice out there that has just drained our our system that has drowned out all of the working people's voices, that smeared, frankly, um, many movement leaders who are out there fighting for working people. The last five years have, have led us to this moment, but there's really not much we as a movement can do at this moment other than look to you for guidance. And I know you're an honorable person, and, and I know you're hearing a lot of, of criticism right now for not taking on Joe Biden at this moment. I know many people think in the media and political operatives, and maybe even people on your campaign probably think that, that it's over, and now is the time to pressure Joe Biden to be more progressive, to bring on somebody onto his ticket that is more progressive, and then to take that to the debate stage. But I had, a, I had a wake up call last night, as I think a lot of folks did, in that we don't know if we have a choice but to support you right now. Electability has been a major issue in the Democratic Party. We know this, right? They always want to say that the person on the left is not electable, and they will come up with whatever skewed logic there is. But I think that America, I think Nancy Pelosi even sees you as the ele electable candidate right now. I think the world is seeing it before their eyes that the only person who has the leadership and the plans and the cognitive ability to defeat Donald Trump and the movement to defeat Donald Trump is you, Senator Sanders. So we want you to say this because what is on the line right now is a pandemic. What is on the line right now is a global economy on the verge potentially of collapse. Nobody can afford this. We are already being crushed. What, what is on the line right now is, is people, children in cages at the border. As you know too well, that was boiling under the surface of the Obama administration. We cannot afford any other option but Senator Sanders being our president right now and our nominee. I was ready to call it a day ago. But I really think that this moment calls for courageous leadership. And we have seen historically Moments that have shifted the future of our country. We've seen elections turn in a moment. And if right now, based on the electoral math, if we're going to look at the delegates, you know, you would need to win 50% of the vote moving forward, or Joe Biden would have to win 56% of the vote turn, moving forward. We know that momentum and the argument of electability is what is gonna shape your getting to 50% moving forward. But if you call it somewhere in between, uh, if we have a convention, 
it will be about those delegates. I think that the Democratic establishment is going to be coming to terms in the next week or so with whether or not Joe Biden is able to make an argument against Trump in the face of a global catastrophe. You have an opportunity, and it is really now just you, Senator Sanders. I think there's a lot of frustration about why we are here, how we weren't able to capitalize off of being the front runners, right, the movement. I think people are pointing fingers in all directions right now, and they probably will. And some of it might be true, some of it might be false, but at this moment, nobody can save this movement and potentially society, but you. I know Joe Biden is your friend. We know that. We know that you cross party lines. We know that the Senate is a lonely place. We know that a Senate is a lonely place for a progressive. We know how you feel about the establishment and the media. But right now, we need you to give faith, to show that you are the calm, courageous leader that the country needs to those people who are outside of the base. We need older voters like my mother who called me up today and said, did you see Senator Sanders talk about coronavirus? That was leadership. We need more of that. We need you to say, I am a Democrat. <laughs> Some voters just want to hear that. We need you to understand that your message is the vehicle right now that'll save us. I don't know if you believe you can win at this point. I don't know if that's your, your strategy or if it's just to pressure Joe Biden. But for those of us who are young, and I'm an older millennial, who have seen what happens after 9-11, who have seen what, and felt what happens after the economy collapsed in 2008. For those of us who were in Puerto Rico after the storm hit, who've seen blackouts, who've been the victims of austerity, who've had their houses foreclosed, who are buried in student loan debt, who are living in the gig economy, who don't have access to healthcare, who have no security net, who don't know if the way that our global economy is structured is gonna protect us and provide us with food in the coming weeks. I think that you are the messenger and the option, the only option that will give us hope. So we need you to make that distinction. Whether or not you believe you can win at this point, or people around you think you can win at this point, the only way that limited path is available is if you believe it. So on behalf of the millions of people who have knocked on doors, opened up their checkbooks for you, who've made phone calls, who've fought hard, taken bullets for the movement. Remember that you are representing us. And Joe Biden might be your friend, but at the end of the day, if we look back at this moment and, and we see it as an opportunity that was lost and, and it really was lost because, because of, a, of a couple of moves. Um, I mean, that really is life and death for, for too many people. So Senator Sanders, I am so proud to have a uh, campaign for you. Perf I'm so proud to have fought alongside all of the warriors out there. Uh, over the last five years. And I'm so grateful for what you've built, something that we couldn't even imagine doable just a few years ago. 
I'm so grateful that you've inspired a new generation to rise up and run for office and win and organize. I'm so grateful that you have shifted the conversation so much back to what matters. I'm so grateful that you've exposed uh, corruption. I am so grateful for what you have done um, in changing the course of history for the better. And I just hope that at the end of the day, before you go to bed at night, you think about those millions of people who are depending on you and the difference between a Biden administration, a Trump administration, and a Sanders administration at this moment in history. There are dozens and dozens of exciting races across the country right now uh, for Congress. There are challengers out there, grassroots candidates who are taking on the establishment, and this is a big feature of our show, is to remind you guys that it's not all the presidential, although that does matter, uh, but there are very exciting races on the ground across the country that you could be volunteering for, making calls for, and of course donating to. Uh, we have featured matriarch candidates, just a reminder to those who, who who may not know, uh, Matriarch is an organization I'm on the board of. It is uh, an organization dedicated to helping and assisting working class progressive female candidates running for Congress. And we know how powerful progressive working class female women, <laughs> women in general can be uh, when they are in Congress. We've seen what happens. And I am excited that one of Matriarch's endorsed candidates is joining us today to talk about her truly inspirational race in Georgia. Uh, Nabila Islam is running for Congress in Georgia's seventh district. Thank you for joining Nabila. How's everything on the ground there in uh, Georgia? Thank you so for, uh, so much for having me today. Uh, things are things are going well. Um, you know, we are, there is a, a little bit of a scare because of the coronavirus right now, but Overall, the campaign has uh, grown a lot of momentum thus far. Let's talk a little bit about your race, because uh, for, for folks who don't know, you know, Georgia has been a tough state for Democrats. And I think we we all know what happened with Stacey Abrams, and she's focused a lot on voter suppression uh, since her race. But Georgia has traditionally been dominated by Republicans, or at least the Republican Party, um, despite the fact that the, the population is is moving more Democratic, if not if they weren't previously just through voter suppression, not not being, uh, they didn't have seats at the table. So, so you're in this district that was won by a Republican, but but it was pretty close, right? Yes. So the Republican only won it. He won his reelection by 419 votes um, in 2018. This was the closest federal election that uh, that a Democrat lost. So uh, it was a pretty tight race, and now it's uh, one of the most competitive races to flip. For Democrats from red to blue right now. That's super exciting and doable, it seems. Uh, but you're in you're in a, a crowded primary, and uh, I think what what is inspiring about your race is that you are different than many of the Democrats running, and that you are progressive. <laughs> you're like an actual progressive. So tell us a little bit about the primary, who's in the race, um, and what what differentiates you from the pack. Sure. So. As you said, this is a super winnable race. Uh, this was a, 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 a race that, a district that Stacey Abrams won when she ran for governor. So it's not if this district will flip blue, it's when it will. And I believe with the right candidate, um, it will flip blue in November. And so um, I'm in a contested primary. Uh, there's about six other candidates. I'm the only candidate that's running on a progressive platform, advocating for Medicare for all, uh, comprehensive immigration reform, and a Green New Deal. Um, all the rest of the candidates are more moderate in the moderate lane. Um, what I like to say, I say that they typically run these Republican light campaigns and don't really lean into who they are. So um, the candidate from last time is actually running again. Um, and there are some other a couple other folks as well. Um, but I really believe that this is going to be a, a two per, a two person horse race between me and the candidate that ran last time. But uh, I'm the only candidate that grew up in this community, wow. and uh, so I under have an intimate understanding of the issues, um, and that's why I'm running on such a progressive platform, because the, the policies that I'm advocating for are the ones that are going to you know, implement a transformational change in our working class community here. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, the primary, which is on May 19th. You, your story is also powerful, too. I mean, you... you 
your family's background, what you bring to the table, personally um, relating to the issues that you're fighting for. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background and why why this is so important. Um, it's such an important part of your message. So I am the daughter of working class immigrants from Bangladesh. Uh, my parents moved to this country seeking the American dream. Uh, they're both survivors of a political genocide. I myself am actually one generation removed from growing up in a tin hut mud floor home, just like my mother did with no electricity, no running water. And they both worked really hard. I mean, my dad was a file clerk at the IRS and my mom, she jumped from low wage job to low wage job in order to give me and my little brother a life that she never had. Um, the first person in my family to graduate from college. Um, and even in high school, I was working to help make my help my parents make ends meet. Uh, with that being said, I grew up in Gwinnett County, which is the fourth most diverse county in the country, which makes up about 85% of the 7th District. And when I was growing up here, I never saw anyone that looked like me at the table. Uh, no one that reflected the diversity or the values of our community. And so that's why I jumped into working on uh, political campaigns right out of college. So I've been working on uh, local, statewide, and national politics for about 10 years now. Um, and now I'm running for office because I think it's so important that there we have a candidate that actually understands uh, this diverse working class district and will fight for the policies that are actually going to help us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually the only candidate that has any policies on their website. So I'm not afraid to speak up. When wow. I need to. Really? Yes. That's insane. How is that even is that is that become a news story at all? It's not yet. <laughs> I uh, I think it's a strategy where if you don't say anything, you don't get hit on anything. But like, if you don't stand for anything, I, I don't know how people are supposed to be inspired. The only way that we're going to flip this district in November is if we have a candidate that inspires the electorate and expands the electorate. And that is what we are doing. What we are working hard every day to do on this campaign. It's incredible, Nabila. I mean, it, it, the fact that, you know, you, you, people may not know this, but you're getting a tremendous amount of, of national media attention for, you know, a grassroots candidate, I should say. There's plenty of candidates who get media attention, but um, there is absolutely a a status quo uh, narrative that that is transcendent <laughs> in the media. And I think it's what's been inspiring is to see how you've been able to break through that with your story and your message. And um, and what you've been able to organize on the ground as well. Uh, you know, I read something today about about uh, coronavirus, and you have been out there talking about how this virus, this pandemic, is affecting campaigning. And and I think you're the first campaign I've seen, at least publicly, discuss this. So can you tell us, like, what are you what are you guys doing? Um, what does that What does this pandemic mean for a grassroots campaign that you know may not be able to afford ads and 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 make up the you know the, the knock on doors? That's a big part of the movement, right? You know, they buy out ads and then we knock on doors and then we beat them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as you said, I'm a I'm a grassroots candidate, and this is a people powered campaign. And uh, our number one strategy is to you know talk to voters face to face, so that they understand uh, the issues that we're fighting for, the policies that we're advocating for. And so we've had a robust field program. And so this morning I made the difficult decision to su suspend all in-person canvassing uh, because of the spread of the coronavirus. I just didn't feel that it would be responsible to put my staff and volunteers in harm's way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in Georgia itself, we have about 22 confirmed cases. Just this morning, someone died from the coronavirus. Oh wow. um, it has yet to be released who they are, where, where this happened. Um, so I, I, my number one priority is for people to be safe. Uh, with that being said, it, it does get a little bit more difficult to campaign um, if, you're no, if you're not canvassing anymore. So um, we are, we're, we're, we're becoming more and more strategic about how we're going to virtually reach out to people. Um, I'm about to schedule my first virtual town hall. Uh, we're great. about to double down on phone banking and text phone banking. Um, but it's a, it's a serious loss though, for not being able to actually go knock on doors. You know, it's interesting because, uh, we, there's been a lot of conversation about the rural vote and, and broadband is such a big issue, uh, for rural communities and, and really people who cannot afford strong broadband. So 
you know, if you do want to reach out to the most vulnerable communities and this is how we're communicating with them, and if you don't have a strong, you know, you don't have a cell phone service or, or decent Wi-Fi uh, or broadband, I mean, it can really affect whether or not uh, your voice is heard in this election based on what you just said. So I haven't even thought about it until just now. No, definitely. I mean, one of the things that we were doing was knocking in neighborhoods that people would people have never gone to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for a lot of people, this is the first time they've even talked to a person from the campaign or from a candidate themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was definitely a competitive edge that we had because I haven't really seen anyone else um, door knocking in the way that we have. And so um, we're good. We're going to make it up though. Um, we are actually doing something very interesting where, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the most diverse districts in the country. Therefore it's one of the most linguistically diverse. Mm. Uh, so we're now phone banking in different languages and we've seen to, uh, that seems to have a very high ROI. So that's something else that we're wow. uh, going to start doing a lot more now. That's, that's brilliant. Uh, for, for folks who are at home who may not live in your district or for people in your district, how can they get involved with your campaign? Um, clearly, you know, you, you need to raise money. So, of course, we want people to give to to Nabila. Uh, but also, you know, what are other ways they can they can help out right now? Sure. Um, I will mention that because of this pandemic, we've had to cancel a lot of our small dollar fundraisers and meet and greets where candidates like me make a lot of our contributions from. So that is something we uh, will need to um, start doing is raising more money online. Mm -hmm. uh, so if people can contribute online, they can go at www.nabila, N-A-B-I-L-A-H-F-O-R, congress.com. And you can remotely volunteer. So if you want to remotely phone bank or remotely text bank, um, you can do that by also going to that same website um, and signing up to become a volunteer. And we will immediately contact, contact you same day. Nabila, super exciting. I, I think that this is the type of story that is going to be, especially when you win, uh, reflected in history books, hopefully. <laughs> if, if, if climate change doesn't get us, we need you in Congress, okay? <laughs> um, no, but seriously, it, you know, we're going to look back in, and look at history and see this was a moment uh, where campaigns really shifted the way that they, they operate. So thank you for, for leading in this and for being a courageous voice and for running. Absolutely, of course. Thanks right. for having me. Thanks, Nabila. If you're not already, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Help us hit 100,000 within three months of launching the show. I think we can do it. Uh, and if you're not a patron, please uh, join us on patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. We're trying to raise $5,000 to build my home studio because uh, this beautiful studio that we're filming out of is going to be shut down uh, as, as folks are worried about guests coming in and contamination. So uh, help us help, help us raise the money, help us build that studio so we can continue to provide uh, this content and and of course you know pay our team and and build you know a great show. Our next guest was a senior advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016. Uh, he is behind that very famous and incredible, probably one of the best ads of all time, uh, the America ad for Bernie Sanders. I am talking about Mark Longabau. He is a partner at DML Consulting, Divine Mulvey Longabau. And uh, we're just so grateful to have him dissect the state of the race with us. Mark, it's great to see you uh, in our quarantined land. <laughs> <laughs> good, to be, good to be with you. Good to be with you. So, wow, as of right now, because things are moving so so quickly, I you know, I have to put a timestamp on this so people know. Uh, this is, you know, we're speaking on Thursday afternoon at 6 p.m. Eastern, and uh, Bernie just uh, gave a speech a couple of hours ago on this, the, his plan to deal with uh, this pandemic. Uh, but we are, we're, we're seeing a limited path for Senator Sanders in this race. What, what's your take as of this moment? Well, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I think it's very, very difficult to see how Bernie Sanders wins the nomination at this point. Um, you know, I, I, I frankly think he's he's run a good campaign. I mean, who who would have who would have thought a guy who had a heart attack uh, in the fall of last year would bounce back and come back and essentially split Iowa, win New Hampshire, and win win the state of Nevada? Um, so I, I think he's going to come up short. Um, 
and, you know, and as a progressive, um, you know, I'm somewhat disappointed in that, but, um, you know, I think, I think he, I think he ran a vigorous race and, and look, Joe Biden, you got to give Joe Biden a lot of credit here too. I mean, talk about being written off and written out. Uh, he's, he had one of the most extraordinary turnarounds with the most powerful movement of momentum I've ever seen in, in the span of 10 days. And, um, I'm not sure there's anything comparable to it in, in modern American politics, frankly. Uh, so, you, you know, you got to give a lot of credit to Joe Biden as well. Usually if there's something like that that happens in a race, it's it's due to another candidate collapsing, you know, some big scandal or or a health issue or something like that happens um, or or, you know, there's outside factors like the economy collapses. Um, but this was this was definitely a form of momentum that I mean, listen, it was it was manufactured, you know, when he's on the side of the establishment and, and the media narrative, he wins one state we all predicted he would win. And everybody lines up behind him. You know, that's that's it's great on their part, but it's not like he had to do any heavy lifting. Um, but you know, and, and obviously Bernie Sanders, they're no fan of Bernie Sanders, so any opportunity they could to to oust Bernie Sanders, they would do it. But what could have you know Senator Sanders done differently in response to the Joe Mentum that that occurred? <laughs> Well, I mean, look, I mean, I, I, I want to say you, you got to, you know, again, give Biden some credit here. I mean, <laughs> politics. I, I mean, mean, come on. Have you heard him lately? Like, I don't think it was his uh, doing. <laughs> but, but, here's, but, here's, but hold on. Here's what I was going to say, which is uh, to be a good politician, you have to have multiple skill sets. It's not just about giving a great speech every night. Right. Uh, Joe Biden has an interpersonal skill that allowed him to be able to get on the phone, talk to, you know, to two candidates who had been in the race against him hmm. and make a case for them not only to get out, but to get behind his candidacy quickly. Uh, you, you know what I mean? That that that's that, that takes political skill. I mean, you know, I, I do agree with you to 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 some extent that, you know, the the the, the media and and establishment elements of the Democratic Party very much wanted all that to happen and gave it a push. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, I, I, I do give Joe Biden some, some credit on that front. And I, and I think, you know, what could Bernie have done? I don't know what he could have done at that point, because it was clear when you see the movement of vote on, on uh, super Tuesday to Biden, yeah. it was clear that there were a lot of Democrats who were looking for an alternative to Bernie Sanders. I mean, I think Bernie Sanders to prevent that had to have fixed that problem before he went rolling into South Carolina and Super Tuesday, and I think they, they, they assumed they were gonna they were gonna be able to run in a divided field and win plurality victories a lot longer than than ultimately they were able to. So, so you know, we're not quite at the uh, point where there's a post mortem autopsy and things are changing very very quickly. So. As as the you know optimistic host here, you know I, I <laughs> want to anticipate you know crazy things happened. Uh, Joe Biden, you know, turned things around overnight, and you know now that we're in, in the last twenty four hours, it, it, not even twenty four hours since they declared a pandemic. I mean, there really is some stuff that that we can't we can't even imagine, right? That could possibly right. happen. But but Senator Sanders also has to be able to deliver on that moment, and and I talked about that earlier in the show is how you know. If there's any hope for him, he really has to out deliver. And I think anticipating not much changing, okay, um, that he goes into the debate and and then whatever happens afterwards, I don't know if he continues his campaign or doesn't. But let's look back a little bit and, and do some analysis before we we can really call it right. right. Um, what part of his strategy this time? I mean, this is a very general question, but what part of his strategy just just top strategy you think uh was missing you know he, he didn't get it he, he missed some opportunities or wasn't focused properly what, what do you think well i mean i think ultimately you, you can't do a hostile takeover of the democratic party and and, and i think too much <laughs> oh of i know that <laughs> i think we tried right <laughs> i think but i but i think that was if there was a flaw in the strategy that was it i right. mean i think you can't you can't constantly attack the democratic establishment and expect to lead the democratic party and and i think that was a mistake senator sanders made i i personally believe he should have run for re-election in vermont as a democrat uh, and i think he should have jettisoned all of that rhetoric about attacking the democratic party 
Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't dispute that there's a, that there's an establishment, but the party is a big tent. And if you want to be the nominee and you want to lead the party, you have to be able to to, to lead all of it. And and I think he gave a lot of Democrats the impression he didn't want to lead all of it, that he only wanted to lead a faction of it. And I think that was that was that was the inherent flaw that was there. Now, I will say, I still believe, and you and I have talked about this on, on countless occasions, his message is still the most powerful message in the Democratic Party. And I, and I think Joe Biden would be very, very wise to pick up a lot of elements of Bernie's message, especially the the, uh, the economic pieces about economic inequality uh, and, and the stagnation of middle class, working class wages in this country. I mean, it, 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 that is that is the way to win back states in the in the Midwest and, and govern this country. And 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 I think you know Bernie had a powerful message. If if he had if he had been able to run the race exclusively on those kitchen table issues, education, healthcare, the economy. Um, I, I, you know, I think the, the maybe the, the outcome would have been a little bit, a little bit different. Interesting. Um, there's been some criticism, uh, and, and I, myself included, that especially in like the last few months when it was very clear that the numbers weren't changing enough, um, that he was focusing too much on like sort of the the like young DSA language of of like wokeness. I I, I don't know how the yeah. right way of saying it is to be honest. It's not yeah. that you don't believe in these issues. It's just you, he he was losing white working class voters, right, and yeah. older voters, and older yeah. voters don't necessarily understand the Twitter the Twitter debate language. You know that we all that I talk. I mean I, I I'm just as guilty of this as as well. But I'm not you know trying to win over these voters in a presidential election. Right. So right. I mean were were there Moments where he didn't pivot, like like even a couple of days ago, frankly, uh, in hitting the message that's going to expand his his electorate. I mean, he didn't. White working class voters voted for him last time, and he's not hitting the numbers that he needs to this time. Well, I mean, I think there there are several reasons for that. Um, one, you have to remember in fifteen and sixteen when Bernie came on the stage. He was fresh. He was the insurgent. He was he was new, uh, and I think voters voters didn't have didn't focus it. They focused, and we were able, I think, in fifteen and sixteen to focus more on that powerful message that I talked about uh, in terms of you know uh, a, a rigged economy uh, propped up by a corrupt system of campaign finance. That was the core of the message in fifteen and sixteen. Uh, I don't think he got enough to that this go round, uh, and I think that message. Uh, was uh, was very res resonant then. Uh, we were closer to the Wall Street crash. And there was there was a lot of anger at, still at Wall Street, and, and when he focused his anger points in the last campaign, they were aimed at Wall Street. Mm -hmm. You know, the hedge fund guys, the billionaire class, the pharmaceutical guys. Uh, this time, you know, I, I think too many times the anger point, like I said, drifted off to the Democratic establishment, the way the media wasn't treating him fairly. And, and, I, and I think those those were not on point um, and uh, and they didn't die, jibe as well with it, with his core message. And so, um, you know, if I was to scroll it back, I mean, I, I think I, I think he would have been been wise to, st to stay on more of a, 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 you know, as I said, a kitchen table uh, set of set of issues. Um, you know, and yeah, he look through much of this campaign, he 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 drifted off. I remember the controversy over the summer when he was talking about felons being able to vote. And, oh, yeah. you know, he was you know, they had a slogan that seemed very empty to me. Bernie beats Trump. I mean, it was just like they, they didn't. But then, the, then again, I want to give him credit. The the heart attack happened, mm -hmm. and somehow that heart attack seemed to refocus him and get him, bring him back to the to the fundamental message uh, that's always been his success. And he, he obviously was very much advantaged by uh, you know uh, uh, AOC you know endorsing him at that moment, and 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 you know he went on a run. Uh, so. Uh, look, I, he, you know, he came up short again, but I, but I, I still think, you know, he's had a profound impact on the Democratic Party, uh, and he's, and he's a significant, uh, significant political leader in this country. So he's going to be uh, debating Joe Biden on the fifteenth. What is the point of the debate at this point? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's. I mean, you were talking about, you know, how quickly things turned around for Joe Biden, and we, you know, this has been a, a you know, extraordinary year. Obviously, we're, we're, we're under the, you know, um, 
this pandemic hang, hangs over our, our, our country and our society at, at this moment. I, I, I think his last chance to get back into the race is to have a good debate moment. And, um, and I think he's, you know, I mean, I think he's, I think he's gambling that he can go into finally get a one-on-one -on -one debate with, with Joe Biden, make the contrast that I think he wants to make, lay out his agenda and, and see if it's enough uh, to be able to turn the tide. I mean, I think it's going to be very difficult, but, um, but I think that's his, that's, that's his one last, um, uh, one last thread to pull here. And, uh, I think he, I think he figures why the heck not, you know, it's only a few days off the, the 17th votes two days later and, uh, we'll see where we are then. And, um, I, I that, that seems to me that the strategy he's pursuing. Do you think he's he, going to he, take he, this all the way? Like he'll, 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 he I, wants everybody to, everybody I, to have an opportunity to vote. Again, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm not part of the campaign this go round. I'm, I'm not inside, so I, I don't know. Uh, but just by reading his co his public comments, you know, he's he's already pledged to get behind the nominee. He's already pledged that whoever goes to the convention with the most delegates, even even if it's a plurality, he will get behind. Um, I, I think he has a, a great deal more. Uh, you know, listen. At this point, vis-a-vis -vis Clinton, last time there was a great deal. There was a great deal more animosity. I don't think he feels that same animosity towards Joe Biden. Uh, my hope and my gut says, if things don't go well on the 17th, uh, he he will pull out of the race sometime soon after that. And um, you know, that's that's not to say that 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 I don't think he is going to go to the convention and and you know want a good speaking slot and maybe some input on the on the platform again and hope that hope that Biden will adopt uh, some some of his important policies but um, I, I don't think he'll prolong this one in the same way we, we you know that we did in 15 16 it's interesting because when you look at the delegate math, I mean, there there's not a huge difference in delegates, like, you know, a little over uh, under 200. Well, right? it's, you know, it's hard. It's hard to tell because, you know, California, right. unfortunately, right. still can't count its ballots. I don't I don't understand how a state with such technological sophistication as California <laughs> uh, can't, can't, can't get its ballots counted. Uh, but, um, you know, that delegate balance, it's its hard to tell where it, where it actually is. But listen, I mean, if if Biden has the kind of night on the 17th that everyone is predicting, it, it's going to it's there's going to be an insurmountable uh, gap there for Bernie. It's interesting, though. I mean, given that, like where Bernie was in 2016 with Hillary and granted, they were factoring in superdelegates the whole time. Uh, yeah. the, the divide is smaller, like the, the difference is smaller. Um, obviously there's been a bunch of different factors like, like California being moved up and, and, and he, he lost Michigan this time around, but it, it is strange to see that like he, it, by delegate math, you know, he could very well go into the convention and have a contested convention. I'm not saying that's possible. I think you just made yeah. a case as to why, but it's, yeah. it's like, why is it this time around it's inevitable for Biden and last time around it wasn't. I think a lot of people are wondering that. Well, I mean, I, I do think the dynamics are, are, are very, very different. Um, I, I, I think that um, that de that delegate lead was a little narrower um, um, than it is now. I, I, I think, you know, clearly Bernie won Michigan last time. We had won Nebraska and Kansas at this point. We had won a whole bunch of things, uh, although Cal California was not not on the front end. Uh, we were able to, we were able to, you know, after Michigan, we then survived a tough night on the 15th and we went off on uh, six weeks and basically won everything. Right. Um, and pe people forget that. Right. And so we went, you know, we won Michigan decisively. I think he got 58% of the vote if my memory serves me correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we went into a showdown in New York. I just think the dynamics were much, much different and the bottom didn't fall out on us ever uh, as badly as it did on him on, on Super Tuesday. Remember, I mean, we, we, we won Minnesota last time. Mm -hmm. we, we won Maine last time. Um, you know, we, we, we won a bunch of things that he got defeated this time in. And um, so there were just, there were just, we had more wins under our belt. And one of the things I always have always argued, people want to get into this argument about counting delegates and delegate counts and this and that. But, but one of the, my philosophy is you got to win every week. And mm. wins are what propel a candidacy. They both propel a candidacy in terms of accumulating delegates, but they also affect the momentum and dynamics of the race in a profound way. And when you're losing and losing everything, mm -hmm. uh, boy, it's it's tough. It's tough to sustain a candidacy. And, and I think that's unfortunately where he's he's gotten to.
the momentum, the can man, I go back of everything. Thing? Go ahead. I, yeah. I just want to give give you a tip of the hat. The reason superdelegates are not being counted this year <laughs> is because you were part of a unity commission that helped take them off the table. So bravo. Thank you, Mark. You were a big part of that too. We <laughs> we had many conversations. And yeah. I have to give you a tip of the hat. I don't know if I can publish <laughs> that. Um, you know, banning uh, conflicts of interest would have been a big factor in this race, at least with Iowa. We didn't get that passed. Shocker. Uh, but that was one of your your great well, the, policy uh, pieces. Yeah, of but you know, we, with the one thing we did do is we actually forced uh, Iowa and Nevada to count heads. And now there's a way to recount. Uh, and and frankly, what the counting of heads did, and this is unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, it just it just evidenced the underlying problems in the Iowa caucuses, mm -hmm. and they were always there. They just kind of got covered up, and uh, and um, you know the changes that you guys forced on forced on them through the Unity Commission. I, I think I don't know what's going to happen uh, to those caucuses going forward, but um, uh, I think there were always problems, and and it's no way to no way to to nominate a president. Yeah, I think so too. I think we. We understand that there's some pluses to having caucuses and that Democrats can control their own primary process in, in specifically Republican states, but at the end of the day. <laughs> well, but you can have, you can have, you know, look, you can have a firehouse caucus. Right, I mean, you right. Have, you want to have a caucus, let's let everybody go in, cast their ballot, and, and they can be on their way. And yeah. that also makes a provision for absentees. And, and I, I just think it's a better if Democrats want to run their own right. run, run their own primary caucus. That's that's the way to do it. It's not this complicated uh, stuff that uh, unfortunately I was I was gotten wedded to. So Bernie now, uh, you know, if, moving forward, what leverage does he have? I mean, in 2016, speaking of the Unity Reform Commission the leverage he had and you were very much part of that. So thank you for just uh, <laughs> negotiating <laughs> the Unity Reform Commission. So we had it. Right. But that was part of the leverage he had in 2016 when he surrendered the delegates to to Hillary Clinton. What leverage does he have now? Oh, I think he's got an enormous uh, leverage. I mean, I, I think after the 17th, even even if he doesn't have a success, successful night, I mean, I think he's going to have probably north of 900 delegates. I mean, you know, he may go into the convention with, with close to a thousand delegates or more. Uh, so I, you know, that's significant leverage in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, so I, I think, I think he has great leverage there, which gives him great leverage on the, the platform committee, leverage on credentials and rules, which are, you know, the important committees that, 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 that govern the, govern the party, uh, you know, the convention. Um, uh, so I think that's he has that. But look, he has the the, the bigger thing of a, of a huge national constituency. Uh, you know, I mean, Joe Biden needs younger voters, millennial voters to, 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 to join his coalition. Latino voters. Bernie has done tremendously well in that community. Joe Biden needs those voters. Um, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders, frankly, let's be, be a little bit crass has a fundraising network that is superior to anyone else on the playing field in the Democratic Party right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Biden, I'm sure, would, would love to have help from, from those supporters and those donors. So I, I think he has tremendous leverage. And then he has another thing, which is he has his ideas, which is always what's animated Bernie Sanders and one of the things that I've always greatly admired about him. Um, so he... He, you know, he has it's sort of those animating ideas, which which I think you know, when you you look at any poll inside of the Democratic Party, his ideas are incredibly popular. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think Joe Biden would would be wise to 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 lean towards uh, some of Bernie's ideas. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have to see how the convention plays out if we have a convention. Um, there's conversation well, right now. That's, you know? a scary, that's a scary and disappointing I mean, I love conventions myself, but yeah. uh, you know, I'm a political junkie. But um, <laughs> yeah, so it, that's a uh, that's a that's a scary thing. I mean, I would I would hate for uh, our nominee have to be would have to be nominated at at a meeting of the DNC and you know in some you know hotel ballroom because we can't we can't we can't gather all of the delegates to the convention. That's right. Because you got to remember, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of folks, you know, there's so many people out there, uh, and you know this, I mean, they work really hard to get themselves elected as delegates, and they, mm -hmm. they pour their hearts into their campaigns and, and uh, all of that effort. And, um, you know, so a convention for those folk is a, folk is a big deal. Yeah, that was that was a big case uh, that we made as delegates, as, as we wanted Bernie. You know, I remember, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell the story, but I remember uh, seeing Jeff Weaver, you know, during the convention, and it was during the platform committee, I think, and and a group of 
you know, organizers and said, Jeff, please, please take it to the floor, take it to the floor, because, you know, not only do we want to fight this out, but we've been doing like crowdsourcing to share hotel rooms. I mean, these were working people yeah. on yeah. the floor of the convention yeah. who yeah. put everything into it. And well, I remember, I, I mean, mean, I was, as you know, I was right yes, there and yes. uh, right, 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 right there zero. with Jeff yeah. doing all of that. And Listen, I, you know, I mean, I think Bernie made the right decision ultimately in 2016 not to take the minority reports that we, we, we wrote up. Can, both you, can you explain what a minority report is for folks who? Minority report is uh, in and the platform committee and all three of the all three of the, the, the standing committees, frankly, uh, if you have 25 percent of the delegates to those committees uh, have the ability to. Uh, to write what's called a minority report and take it to the f the floor of the convention for a vote of the full convention, uh, and it, it's uh, you know it's an important democratic rule to have in our rules, but it's also can be very disruptive, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and so uh, you know the, the the delegates didn't quite you know Bernie's delegates inside a plat the platform committee did not agree with that on on some of the language of the platform therefore they wanted to write uh, uh, you know amendments to that and they drafted up four or five uh, different different policies one one was Medicare for all there were there were a host of other things um, yeah I think it, was one and then fracking. what was it Fracking TPP and fracking. Yeah. There were there were a couple of climate pieces. There was there was there was a there was there, there were there were several that we that we were going to take to the floor. And ultimately, Bernie um, made a decision that that he did not want that disruption on the floor. And we did not we ultimately didn't didn't submit those those minority reports. And then later, as you remember, on the rules, uh, there was a movement to write up write up plank to take to the floor to eliminate superdelegates. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, um, Bernie, Bernie, because we were able to to get the Clinton, uh, count, uh, you know, folk to agree to the Unity Commission, uh, which we did pass at the convention, as you remember, which created the Unity Commission. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we didn't we didn't do that. So. So moving forward, I mean, before before we wrap up, uh, you know, what hope do we have? I mean, other than the, the the leverage that Bernie has, I mean, we're putting Corona aside because that's just such a factor. We can't. We can't yeah, let's 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 hope, let's hope let's hope that you know that the the sort of that that breaks you know that that like the traditional influenza that sometime in the spring as it gets warmer, uh, the whole thing breaks and, 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 uh, hopefully we don't, we don't lose more folk to, to that, to that, uh, virus, uh, and things get back to normal by June, um, June ish. I don't know. I'm not an expert on any of these things. Um, and we have a convention. Uh, listen, I think, I think there are several things that progressives can hope for. I, I mean, I think Joe Biden very well may pick, uh, a, a very progressive individual to be to be his running mate. Uh, I think that's likely to be a woman, and I think uh, we can all name several very progressive women that we'd love to see on that ticket. So uh, I, I think that's very much a real possibility. I do believe that Joe Biden, um, you know, could could uh, you know, with a conversation or two with Bernie Sanders, decide that there are a few of his policies that he that he'd like to pursue. Obviously, you know, Senator Sanders goes back to the United States Senate and is a very powerful individual. If we have a Democratic president, uh, I know there's a lot of policy he'd like to work on. So I think I think uh, there there are some very, very good things can can happen if we can win this presidency back and get rid of Donald Trump. And we have a, you know, a generation uh, to several generations. I mean, every Bernie, those, those that generational divide was uh is stark. I mean, the the seventy percent collectively of voters, Democratic primary voters under fifty, supported Bernie Sanders. I mean, that gives me hope that we are going to be able to change this country hopefully sooner uh, rather than later. And pressure. Uh, no, listen. I, one of one of the most encouraging things to me about American politics today is the millennial generation and the generation right behind them. Mm -hmm. My two young sons happen to be part of that, that generation, and uh, as you know, my my youngest son worked for Bernie up in New Hampshire, even though we did not, my firm did not work for Bernie this time around. Uh, and I I know personally that the degree to which Bernie has kindled an idealism idealism in a lot of these voters and 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 they come to they come to politics with an idealism that's very encouraging anyway mm -hmm. uh, and you see folk in the sunrise movement and many of these progressive movements that are out there um, it's the most exciting thing to me in politics today is 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 these younger voters and 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 their 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 progressive impulse uh, so yeah I I will 
hopefully uh, you'll be working on the next progressive presidential campaign and and framing the messaging because I missed having you around, <laughs> if I can say that. Listen, we got to work for a very good progressive this time around, Andrew Yang. Oh, and, come and on. I'm proud of that campaign. <laughs> and, and, and listen, uh, universal basic income is, is, is an idea that he put on the map, and I think we're going to be talking a lot about it into the future. <laughs> and by the way, we are going to see Andrew Yang do some significant things in this country down the road. He's, he's, an, he's an extraordinary talent. Okay, we can agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> Okay, well, we can, we can offline, but, we can have a conversation. But you know what? I will say, now I can put Andrew Yang in our YouTube uh, title, and we will get a good, solid, like, boost because Andrew Yang and the Yang gang will click on it. They well, just listen, have to suffer to, through the things, entire interview to get to it. <laughs> you know, I don't know what policies you didn't agree with for, for Andrew Yang, but one of the things you have to admit is he brought a positivity to yes. the campaign yes. that was that was refreshing in an era of where we are always at each other's throats and it's just so, the Twitter sphere is just so negative. He was just like a breath of fresh air he because comedic he was, relief. <laughs> you know, he was trying to put positive things on the table and, and, and you know, his humanity first um, uh, idea, I think is, is one that we, as Democrats, we need to wrap our minds around, which is uh, really important. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I, I think folks a lot, especially in the last couple of days, um, in discussing the state of the Democratic Party and how Bernie's message could have possibly shifted, is is focusing more on on the humanity aspect and what and, what these uh, policies mean. On, yeah, you know, that, that everything. This is this is an old idea that that Bobby Kennedy raised way back in 1968, which is we cannot measure you know the quality of our lives or the health of our families you know based upon the gross national product. That's right. And uh, and uh, we need we need to we need to, to to look at these things a little bit differently and uh, and and find a way to value caregivers, value value a lot of folk that uh, that, that that are not dropping dollars to the right. bottom line, but right. but that are that are the essence of what this country is about. Right. And you know, I think this pandemic that we're in is is something that is exposing the vulnerabilities no, of not protecting. Think, our most think of how many, how many, how many, you know, caregivers and and first responders and 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 healthcare professionals. I mean, they're putting their lives on their line line out there. And um, and um, so I think I think we hopefully this thing will break and and we we owe them a great debt for 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 taking the fight to it. Absolutely, Mark. Thank you. Uh, you hopefully, we can have you back on for. You know, another analysis. Who knows okay. what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks? So, um, let me know. I look forward to seeing you at the okay. virtual convention. Okay. All right. <laughs> in July. Uh, I'm, still, I'm still hopeful we're going to have a, an old style, good, good, uh, good uh, four day convention. Just do me a favor. Can you help me get floor passes? That's all I want. If I, because I don't know who would even go to anymore. The DNC doesn't respond to my emails. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the outside now. I, I don't know if I can help. You know, you've been around long enough. I'm sure you could pull a few strings. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Okay, see you guys. Take care. Thank you to Mark Longabau and to Nabila Islam for joining the show this week. Stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. Uh, make sure to wash your hands for 20 seconds with antibacterial soap under that hot or very cold water. That is what I'm told. And... Make sure to clean your iPhones because these things are disgusting. <laughs> if you're not a patron, please go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Help us build our home studio. And of course, uh, click subscribe. I think a lot of us are going to be home watching YouTube and looking for important progressive content, especially uh, in the face of, of this madness. So uh, please support your independent media. Uh, the economy, I think, is 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 probably gonna be affected. Um, and I, I, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about independent media when we need it. So these contributions mean the world to not just us as a team, but really to the, the universe of folks who, are, who need to have these voices, to need, who need to have uh, another perspective, who need to have the curtain pulled back um, and to, to show what's really going on. I mean, this is not happening on cable news and we're not gonna deliver you hysteria. We're going to continue to provide uh, real interviews with, with thoughtful people and dive deeper into these issues. And uh, especially as this Democratic primary closes up, um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of conversation about the role of the DNC and, and progressive movements 
in, in pressuring the Democrats to, to stay progressive. So just very grateful for all of your support uh, thus far. I think that um, we never thought the show would grow this fast, and we're just, just grateful to you all. Thanks.